So the presentation I want to do in this uh, hour, the, the goal is to end the whole demo in about 40 minutes, is to show, uh, to talk about how do we build public websites using Flow. And it might seem like a really super strange topic, like John, what, what are you trying to do? Or why are you showing this? Um, the reason really, and I call this the Flow gem stack. And uh, we'll get into this a bit more in some more points. But the main reason is that, uh, in the in the web uh, world, in you know, outside of the power platform, outside of even the office or or uh, business application platform, just in the web world, uh, there is this word called the gem stack. A gem stack is a JavaScript API and markup. So J A M. Now JavaScript includes other bits, right? Like CSS style sheets and all this stuff. Um, the gem stack has is emerging as one of these. Uh, uh, really hot areas of uh, how a developer will go about building a very modern website. So this is a word that's increasingly popular. And various cloud vendors, Azure, AWS, a uh, whole bunch of other uh, players, uh, Cloudflare, Netlify, whole bunch of them, uh, they are all moving into the space to quickly cover many of the gaps uh, in their pro, uh, in their offering. Now, I was look, I use Gemstack myself, but increasingly I see it in a way that, well, there's no reason why us in the power community could not use these techniques uh, to build a public website. So I tried to put together this deck, which is really, uh, there is a lot of flow in it, but there is also a bit of setting up your cloud. So a bit of Azure, a bit of uh, APIs um, to kind of hook up the end of it. So I kind of want to put together this presentation, squish it into 40 minutes uh, and show you all how to build one that's end to end and uh, see where we go. So a quick about me. That probably that intro probably shouldn't be in the title, but anyway, uh, quick quick little bit about me. My name is John Liu. I'm based in Sydney. Uh, I gave myself a name Flow Ninja a while back because I was doing a lot of hacking with Flow. Uh, I made a company called Flow Studio, and then I made a product initially called Flow Studio, but now it's called Power Studio. Uh, my background is a developer. I'm also a consultant, a blogger. Been blogging for a decade. Uh, community, I do. Um, I'm quite busy in the community down in Sydney and in Australia. Um, and now I have my own little startup. I am a business application MVP, and I'm also an Office uh, SharePoint MVP for quite quite a while. Uh, the best place to find me is on Twitter, so you should follow me on Twitter, John N Liu. There's an extra N in there. Look for the guy that has that face or is pointing at a path to the cloud. Uh, that's what that is. It happens to be the Seattle, what's that called? The the elevator. I forgot what that's called. The, seat, the tower that's in Seattle. Anyway, it's a path to the cloud. Uh, you can find me there. You can find my blog on jungliu.net. OK, so the very quick agenda, what is the gem stack? I want to get in a little bit deeper about the technical definition of what it is and what it isn't. Uh, build a. I want to spend a good 40 minutes just building one and iterate and throwing new ideas and maybe take your ideas and embed it into it uh, if we have time and then uh, leave time for questions at the end. Most likely I will take your questions and I may need to go and make more video or make a deep dive video about that question. So uh, have them ready. Some of them probably are too hard to answer in 10 minutes. All right, what is a website? And um, this is really going back to the fundamentals. And traditionally, we have uh, to have a website, you, your user uses a browser. Your website runs on a server, and your server may talk to some data source. So that's how these things work. Um, in a gem stack, your user is still coming in from the browser, but you are very strict about not having a server. You do not want to run a server. OK, the server is the piece that is expensive to scale. Like I will host a server down in Australia and you will get rubbish performance over in Europe. Um, and if I want to spin out 20 servers in every edge data center, 
I'm paying for them even though no one's using them. So nobody wants servers. Everybody, uh, to, to do a GemSec properly, you need to put your files in storage and then put the CDN in front of it. So when you come to my GemStack website, you're not hitting my server. You're talking to a CDN that's right next door to you, right? So when we create GemStack from Europe, when you access my site, um, you should see five milliseconds to, to get that data. I mean, it's not, you're not coming to Australia. Okay, um, and, uh, and there's API. So most of the time is that the content that I already push out next to you, but sometimes you may still want to send some data back to my server, right? You want to do some active dynamic stuff. So there is still the API uh, for us to talk to some sort of backend system or do some real work rather than just publish a lot of PDFs out in this static world, right? The APIs allow it to be dynamic. Uh, so there is still the data source in the back. So the big difference between the modern gem stack which kind of this term was kind of put together probably two years ago, two or three years ago. Um, and uh, you will see this everywhere. This word gem stack, where you will see everywhere. I think that the classic joke is that uh, you, you look for a developer with experience and people are asking, oh, we want developers with seven years gem stack experience. It's like it doesn't, well, the word doesn't exist, but the technologies have existed for some time. Uh, so uh, again, the short gemstack is JavaScript API and markup. Okay, the markup includes HTML, JSON, maybe CSS, you know, to make your site look pretty. You will see my website looks absolutely plain. And that's because I wanted to do more API work. I haven't touched up and make the website prettier. So maybe um, as I polish this and it will get better, but today you have to see a super plain website. Uh, and the benefits on the left hand side. See, this is supposed to have animation. They're not supposed to just over appear. Um, on the left hand side, you have not gem. What is not gem? Uh, a, a site built with some sort of content management system. Say, for example, you can use SharePoint. You can't really use SharePoint now for a public site, but in the past you could um, uh, for WordPress, right? So these are content management systems that give you a framework. You put all your content in it and then you can only play within that space and they still have the same limitations. They don't scale as nicely. If you want to scale them, you have to pay for it. Um, in the JavaScript world, we build these things called single page applications, like Angular, React, a uh, few, they're all single page applications. Uh, there is a technology that's probably around for about seven years, seven or eight years now, that's called uh, server-side rendering. There's a funny word, isomorphic rendering. But basically is the server pretends to run your JavaScript, which is supposed to run in the browser, but your server runs it in memory first and then take these snap static uh, HTML snapshots. And then when the user first come to your site, before they load all the JavaScript, the server is spitting out the HTML files at them. So that's how some startup websites could behave so quickly, particularly on the mobile phone. Because even though it's a full JavaScript application, the first experience that you get is actually a fully rendered and cached uh, HTML page that the server spat at you before you load all the JavaScript kind of in the background. Uh, so that's that technique. And that is, it's a cool technique, but it is super complicated, uh, requires you to really understand one of these three frameworks really well. Uh, so it is not Jam. And finally, uh, what we've been doing for the last 20 years, and not JS, the last 10 years, where we run a whole bunch of C-sharp code, run on the server, and then generate HTML for each visitor. Uh, that is definitely not gem. And what is gem? The best benefits of having a gem stack is that uh, you have the best performance because, like I said earlier, your visitors are seeing your site directly from the CDN that lives next door to their ISP. Right, so you are accessing the internet through your internet provider. Your internet provider has a bunch of machines that directly tie to one of these uh, cloud CDN providers. So literally, you are getting my website from your local network, right? It's like from your ISP directly to you. Like you don't come to Australia to get your website. Uh, best performance. 
uh, even on this world, even on the left hand side, this world, to get that kind of performance, you need to put a CDN in front anyway. Uh, so we're just going to skip that and go straight to the CDN as our web server. Second, uh, higher security, because you no longer really have a WordPress that has vulnerability or try to open SharePoint to the public. That's crazy. Um, you are not, uh, generally single page applications could be safer uh, because they're mostly JavaScript. Uh, but again, with Node.js and C Sharp, you are potentially exposing a server that is risky. But people could exploit vulnerabilities in your web server software to get access to your web server. And once they're in your web server, they could see your secrets to connect to your database and everything goes bad. So um, that's not good. Cheaper and very scalable hosting. So Gemstacks and CDNs are super cheap. Uh, they are so cheap. They are cheaper than the coffee I have every day, uh, monthly. So you pay like, I don't know, a dollar a month. Like, you know, you, you, you might say, oh, my company will never buy it for me. Just buy it yourself. It's fine. Just swipe your credit card. It's $2 a month. Um, uh, and better developer experience, and I call this word developer in the sense that uh, it, uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility. You're not really tied down to a specific platform. Like these single page applications require you to know Angular or React super well and tie it around a whole bunch of libraries that work with it. So there's a lot of investment into getting things going. Whereas on the gem stack here, it describes a kind of a pattern to build these modern applications. Uh, so you have quite a lot of choices in how you can mix and choose. And I'm going to have to run forward because I'm really not going to have enough time if I keep talking. Uh, go to demo and let me run to demo and I have too many browser windows. Let me go to not that one. That is way too many browser window. I should just close all this. Um, so let's start here. Um, the first one I want to do is Call a flow code update public site. Okay. So this is where I want to start. Um, uh, last few weeks, I've started a YouTube series about uh, building a gem stack. So uh, I don't know whether I'm going to assume you haven't seen it. So we're, we're going to cover that very quickly. Do you guys have super slow um, flow portal? <laughs> super, super slow. Let me, let me, while, while it's being slow, let me close a few more things. Uh, just close all the tabs. Yeah, all right, there we go. Okay, so uh, this is the flow that uses a button. This is just a button trigger. I am getting my data from a SharePoint list. Uh, and actually, I will show you that list. So this is a, a SharePoint list inside my SharePoint site, and I just call it guest book, and it's got one entry. Um, the idea of a gen spec has nothing to do with SharePoint. The whole reason I'm using SharePoint is because uh, um, what is it? I'm trying to demonstrate that you can create a public site disregarding whatever your backend is. So I happen to use the SharePoint list, but it could easily be a SQL, SQL Server. It could be, um, you know, other type of, like Flow has 330 connectors. So and most of these connectors, you could put one of these uh, static site in front of it, should you need to. Right? And you can mix and match data sources. So it could be that some of my data come from SharePoint, some of my data came from a SQL Server. Uh, and you want to push both these data into your static site and create this kind of result. So um, let me come back here. So uh, the, the scenario I have is actually, I want to build a static site that give visitors a guest book. So you can go to my guest book, put the entry, uh, it will display all the other messages everyone left me, and then what else would it do? And it will also show messages from here. So uh, that's my guest book. Uh, do I do anything? No, I don't do anything. I modify by the, I order by the modify, so the last modify that I'm descending. So I want the latest uh, message up the top. Um, then I do this action. I use an action called select. Uh, I wrote a blog post about select, but basically 
select is one of those flow actions that helps you map a array of JSON, such as to get items, into a more simple one. Right, so this SharePoint one probably returns 30 columns. A lot of them are system columns that we don't care about. Well, I just want to pick out three of them. I want the title, I want the message, and I want the modify. Right, and I want to actually rename them. So rather than saying title, I'm going to call it who. One of the well, message is message, and rather than modify, I will say when. Okay, so these three. Okay, three, three uh, columns. Then uh, I use another action for create HTML table, and this is a uh, um, this one you could do you know specific custom columns, and that gives you experience similar to this. But usually, because I already know which columns I want, which is these three, I just make this automatic. So I basically put the output of this in here. That's the select, okay, and that will create HTML table of this thing. Uh, I do a few more, one more piece. Uh, in here, I have this HTML table, which is my list of guest uh, messages, and I put that here. Um, and we'll come back to this form input later, but imagine I put a bit of HTML in front of it. There's a header, there's a hello guest, and then there is uh, an, an HTML. Okay, and then one more piece is I write this to a blob storage. So this is the Azure blob storage. We'll go and see that in a second. I write that to a blob storage go to uh, a folder within my blob storage called public it's here, and I'm going to write it to a file called index.html. I'm going to call it uh, compose. Yeah, just the output of that. And then I'm going to give it a content type. So I'm explicitly telling the blog storage that this is going to be a text HTML file. Okay, because otherwise it doesn't know, right? It thinks, oh, what's this? Just save it in there. Blob storage doesn't infer the content type from the file name. So uh, you kind of have to tell it. Otherwise, it treats everything as binary or text. Uh, that's just how the blob storage works. So uh, I will show you these two in a second, but let's just run this. Uh, if I just run it, and in fact, let's add another line in here. Mm. Get started with uh, automation Saturday. Okay. So exit that. So there's two rows. Um, we will run this flow, and I have a button trigger, so I could just run it on uh, when I invoke it. And the flow runs very quickly. It pulls back to. Uh, um, list items from the SharePoint. Again, this could be SQL, CDS, whatever. Um, and if I scroll down, you'll see SharePoint has a lot of these columns, identifier, use folder, thumbnail, don't care. We don't care any ab about any of them. Using the select, we pick out from these lots of columns, we pick out basically three columns. Okay, so that's what select does. Cleans up the array that you're working with, so it doesn't have as many things. Um, we can feed the, that cleaned up array directly into the create HTML table. And the create HTML table works almost like a debug. Like I use this a lot as a debugging. So if you have some sort of uh, just a value like a text or a number, you can use compose to do a debug. But if you have an array, uh, and hopefully one that doesn't have you know 50 columns, but like if you have five columns, then this works really well as a kind of a um, debugging, right? Like you could just quickly see while you're debugging what's in this table. So rather than scrolling down this crazy little scroll bar, you just use this to have a look. Uh, so that's super cool. Um, and you can see these are the two items. And the second one is sorted on top. And uh, I create the HTML and then I write that to the blob. Okay, now let's go and show you the blob. Blob storage. So to build the public stack, we need to do two more things, two more pieces. The first one is, uh, and these are in Azure, in storage account over here, uh, I created a blob storage, and I will show you where to go, but I won't actually click it. Create a resource group. I think I just call it guestbook. Uh, I created a new one called guestbook and put that in there. Uh, give your storage account a name. I call my guestbook JL. 
Because if you do guestbook, it will say it's taken. So it's very unhappy. It's like someone's taken guestbook. Won't give it to me. So anyway, I make a JL. I also pick Australia. Okay. Um, and then what did I do? Standard, really. And this is the part. This is one. I will say this. The replication just local is good enough. You don't need to pay extra for geo redundant. Just local. That means you have two copies in the same month. That's that's enough. Uh, you want the hot? You want, you don't want the cold because we are accessing it fairly frequently. So using hot, uh, and then just review and then create. So there's two buttons. You got to review first and then you create a uh, second. So that's the first piece we need to build, uh, and that one can create very quickly. We need to do a second one, and that one is called an Azure function. Um, and let me show you how to get there. How do we get there? Azure functions. Functions. OK, <laughs> I don't know how to get there as your functions. Oh, function. oh, there, function app, so no Azure. Uh, click function app. Uh, if you don't have any, this will be blank. Uh, add a new one. Uh, again, you can pick the same resource group. Keep them together when you're kind of doing reporting across your subscription. Give it a nice name. So I, I give the guestbook JL as well, which is now taken because I made it. Um, in here, you can pick whatever stack. Uh, .NET Core is pretty quick, so use that one. We're not actually going to do any actual real functions. We're only using Azure function for a very specific purpose, which is the uh, for the API. But and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, pick, yeah. So base, yeah. Anyway, pick the latest. Make sure you pick one close to you. Don't don't pick Australia. Uh, I leave Australia to me. I, I need Australia, so you don't use Australia. I use Australia. And Eliza, if you're still on the call, you should use New Zealand. Don't use Australia anymore. OK. <laughs> uh, she might be gone. No, okay. I'm still here. Oh, OK, good. Yeah, use New Zealand. Congrats. Dollar Center. Soon. Yeah, um, <laughs> coming soon. Coming soon. Yay. And uh, so those are the two pieces. And then uh, once that's created, let me pop over here. And I'll show you. This is the storage account. And then this one is the uh, functions. Oops, go to resource. Um, yeah, kind of. Right, OK. So this is the Azure function, guestbook JL, and that's the container. And I'll show you the container first. So in the container, uh, we go down to, so in the overview, you come to something that looks like this. Click the container. There are other bits in the storage account. You could have a, a basic table. So you can actually create a whole table and run it from here as well. There is a queuing mechanism if you want that. Uh, but generally, we work with containers for blobs. Create a container called public. Uh, it's just a blob container. And then change the access level of this container to the middle one, which is blob. So you don't want it to be you know, completely private. You also don't want container, because container means that anyone could come in and see all the file names and fetch all the files. So you only want this where. If people knew the file name, then they can access it, but otherwise uh, they can. So that's a good uh, kind of middle way for the static side that we want to do. OK, uh, so that's that. And earlier when we did the flow, it published the index file. So that would be this one. So oops, too quick. But if you see the date time, uh, right now it's 7.27. So that is the file that was previously updated. If I quickly, can I quickly see it here? I don't know if I can see it. Can I, can I add it? Sorry, quickly check. Oh yeah, there's added. So I can actually add it in here. In fact, you'll see this is the, this is what the flow generated, and then this is the table. Um, it's very good about not giving, you know, it's like let's not waste time with spaces. It just squishes everything into one big uh, table uh, thing. So that's that. So this file will sit inside the uh, oh, storage container. Now, next, we need this bit. So over in the Azure Functions, typically a developer come here and we go into Functions here and we add all our functions. And this could be .NET, this could be JavaScript, you know, all these crazy functions that do our bidding. Uh, but in our particular use case, we're actually not after the functions functionality at all. 
we want to head right down to proxies. OK, and in proxies, basically what Azure functions give us is a super cheap way of doing API management. OK, and the idea really is this. Um, uh, let me let me pull up a notepad. So in, in, in the public side here, say, if, for example, I take this file and I copy this. And you could, because the way I set it to be guest readable, you see, I can already go to that URL, right? That's just served from the storage. Now, if you go to that URL, you're coming all the way to Australia, coming through uh, uh, spending my bandwidth and then fetching it all the way back to Europe. Uh, you can, but it's a super long trip. And also it has a super ugly URL, right? Like blog.core.windows. That's crazy. Imagine building your website on that. Imagine sending your customers to that. Um, so we want that, but uh, in Azure Functions, what we then can do is we create a proxy and say um, the Azure Function, we're going to do two pieces. First, we're going to have an index. We create a rule that says anything with a slash, we are redirecting to the index file, okay? And that's a get. So if I copy this, we're basically saying anything that's that go to here. Okay. So already we make this URL a lot cleaner. See here. And then uh, secondly, this part I um, if we have time, I come back and oh, God, damn it. Let me let me quickly tweak this. So I need to do um, a Cloudflare. Not really um, a gem site if I don't put a CDN in front of it, so I need to, but I haven't logged in. So uh, this is my Cloudflare account, and I think in my demo, I um, I created the entry under, where is it? Oh, no, wrong one. Oops. OK, uh, I show Cloudflare because Cloudflare has this wonderful thing called free websites. Uh, create a Cloudflare account. You could use a whole bunch of this stuff for free. Um, you can't actually buy the domain in Cloudflare, but you can transfer it to Cloudflare to manage it afterwards, which I do. Um, but that's uh, that's another story. So. Let's come back here. So we have this URL called uh, guestbook. And basically in Cloudflare, I created guestbook.jonglu.net is my uh, website. And I've created a, a DNS reference. And I'm not actually going to go here anymore. That was this URL. Now I just want to come here. OK, so I want to come here and just paste that. Uh, actually, I don't think I. I don't think I keep this part too. I think it's just this. We'll find out very quick. Now, Cloudflare mostly runs in proxy mode, which means that the CDN is active. For us to uh, validate and get Azure happy, we need to turn that off first. So turn that off so it's purely DNS. And then we come to uh, Azure Functions here, come down to Custom Domains. And we're going to tell it that, OK, we want to add a custom domain. And it's going to be called guestbook.jongliu.net. Validate. Do I need to type HTTPS? I forgot. Uh, yep, yeah, it's talking to the DNS. And it says happy. Because uh, this will be talking to Cloudflare, which says, yep, the Cloudflare is pointing back at you. So that's what Cloudflare is saying, which is why it, it allows me to add. OK, so you need that to set that up. And then once that's happy, once Azure is happy, you come back here. Oh, gosh, everything is slow. OK, uh, once that's happy, uh, custom is, yeah, that's all right. Um, once it's happy, come back here and turn back CDM more. So that will turn that back on. And we're done with Cloudflare. And now if I go to uh, Guestbook, that will go through Cloudflare and come right into my static website. In fact, 
if you go to gasboot.jolly.net, it is served from Cloudflare from your nearest CDN to your browser uh, without even coming to me. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, yeah, it's looking for a... The browser always look for a favorite icon. If I show you all, where is it? Oh, no, it's not doing it now. Um, yeah, browser usually look for a favorite icon. So you'll say there's no icon to appear up here. So that's where the little error was. Okay, so that's uh, that's that. And how am I doing for time? I'm never very good at this. All right, let's do a quick fix here. Um, I want this to... Now, we don't want to manually update our website. That's silly. We want to basically say, no, 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 no manual update. We want whenever the data source changes, an item is created or modified. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, on the guest, on the guest book. And we don't actually care what's in it because we fetch everything and regenerate it anyway. So if we do that and save it, and then we go back. Now this part is when sometimes flow doesn't trigger so quick. Let me just sit here and watch it. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do a new one. Um, So I don't know when the flow will execute, hopefully quick. Sometimes it takes, you know, minutes. See, <laughs> hurry up. <laughs> what else can we talk about while it's waiting? Let's, so let's talk about the next bit. So the next bit uh, I showed a little bit earlier. And if I pop over here and pop into uh, our storage account and go into the index and uh, this is the next bit. The next bit is I want some way for you to leave a message with me. And the way I've done it is uh, I create a little HTML form. It's got a submit button. Uh, it has two text boxes, a person and a message. And that's going to send it to this URL. And this URL is actually um, my second flow. It's this one. Uh, that one. So second flow. Oh, uh, I usually say this up front, but um, because we're updating a lot of blob storage which is premium, we're also using a lot of HTTP and HTTP requests. These are all premium actions in flow. So uh, this kind of a fun tip, it does need a premium account, but you, you're really all running always as the owner. So you need one premium account, not, you know, hundreds, you just need one. Okay, oops, I should have gone back. Let me quickly show you this one. So this is a HTTP. Um, and uh, what are we doing here? Here is a compose where I just want to show the trigger, whatever is being sent. Um, I, what do I do here? Oh, okay, right. Um, this is probably best if I just demo it. So if I go to this one of these URL, if I go here, say, and I say, um, let's double, let's double check I created in the right place. Okay, good, good. So if I go here and I say, um, John from the web, submit that. So that's going to quickly, oh, it redirect to a bad place. Oops, that's a wrong URL. We can fix that in a sec. Um, but basically, if I come and show you this now, you see that 11 seconds ago, the website had called this URL. It had passed in. It's hard to see it from this guy, which is why I write the JSON out. Um, from the trigger information, if I scroll down, you can see this queries. Okay, so the HTML form uh, called the flow as a web service and passing the two text boxes as query values. Uh, I type John with a space. Who does that? Anyway, um, I, and they come back here as queries. Uh, using the past JSON, I was able to pull the two values out. 
and then I use it to write to my backend data source. See here. Uh, in fact, the the title is a person. So I actually remap remapped it when when I write it back. And then once that's created, um, I then send a response response back to the web page that call it. Now the response I send back is actually a HTTP redirect. But I was redirecting to a bad URL. That URL don't exist anymore. That was an old URL uh, when I was doing the video. So let's just switch that out. We don't need that bit now. In fact, we could just do that. That's fine. OK, so next time, uh, should we do another one? Yeah, let's do another one. Oh, if I just refresh this. So I hit F5, uh, the new one hasn't appeared yet. So you know how I write to SharePoint, but then I have to wait for SharePoint's trigger to refresh the website. So there's a little bit of lag there. And that's an, an area I was thinking, perhaps uh, if you wanted to refresh right away, when you call the update, you also regenerate the file. So you don't wait for the trigger, uh, maybe. Or maybe, um, Maybe use logic apps, which can configure the trigger to be pulled more often, but you do pay a little bit more for that. Uh, so this is uh, from the web too. We're going to do that again. And you'll see it redirects back very briefly. OK, so that's uh, that's that bit, which does that. How am I doing for time? Wow, 40 minutes, 10 more minutes. What else are we going to do? Um, one more bit, one more bit. Sorry, sorry about my kids. They're yelling outside. <laughs> and whoa, whoa. It's Saturday night. They are like in between dinner and TV. OK, next one. Let me quickly go back to the first flow. Sorry, not that one. The first flow. And I actually, I'll quickly show the third flow. So um, the. The third flow is really uh, the third flow is really um, it's a different idea, but basically in my guest site, I have a separate documents library with a bunch of pictures and uh, even PDF and whatnot. Um, and I created a flow that basically so the basic idea is that sometimes within your company you generate files that it's now safe to share publicly, maybe to an external user or something public. So this is the idea that um, you can uh, internally work on your images and your PDF, but when it's approved, you then have flow copy it also out to the same public site. So um, I'll probably just describe this now. Yeah, so so imagine these pictures and I, I really like um, I like I like this one. John John is shocked. Uh, so that makes a super nice uh, picture to put next to maybe here. Hello, guest. Anyway, I haven't done it yet, but um, it will be done before I do my next demo. It will this will get cleaned up some more. Um, uh, but yeah, so that's that idea. But let me come back to this flow. So get rid of that, and I'm back to this flow. So update public site. I earlier I did the second thing, which is that. Um, when I generate the HTML, I also take the JSON, which is what that select is. Like that select creates a JSON array, and then I write it to a second file called uh, data.json. In fact, uh, I call it application JSON. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so um, whenever the SharePoint updates, it writes these two files. Let me just double check. I've got this correct. Yeah, it looks kind of correct. OK, and then uh, I'm going to actually do a bit of a cheat and shortcut a little bit. So uh, let me close that one. If I go to, uh, there's a different file, there's a different index file that I built earlier. Here's something I created earlier. Um, here's where I wanted to kind of introduce the idea that um, uh, the JavaScript, right? The JavaScript in the gem stack. And then, uh, it's the same HTML, so imagine here's the table, 
Uh, there is just a little bit more that I wanted to add. The first part is I referenced. So you to do this JavaScript, you need a little bit of a helper library, and I picked the simplest one, which is jQuery. Now jQuery is about 20 years old now. It's it's uh, one of the simplest uh, way to do JavaScript. So I just want to show a little bit. So we need to reference jQuery, and then jQuery has this syntax. The AJAX method basically is a helper to call uh, some sort of web servers um, to get some data back for us. Now, in our particular case, when the flow runs, it creates the HTML, but it also writes this JSON. See, it writes the JSON file. Um, so basically, what I'm doing is that the, the JavaScript is actually just pull that JSON, get the value back, and then update the table as it goes. So let's, uh, I have some old data in it. You'll see this. And if I come to, um, where is my many, many URLs, one of these. So if I go to index, index one dot index, I hope I get the right. So you, you'll see that quick refresh. I don't know whether you see it. Yeah, anyway, too quick. I have to slow down my, uh, if I slow down my internet, I might hit, hit the stream. But um, basically, the idea is that uh, with a bit of JavaScript, your your user doesn't have to refresh the page to see the latest data. Your JavaScript could, you know, pull the static file in this case data.json every once every five minutes. Uh, doesn't really help me because you're hitting the CDN, right? And when the backend updates, I'm going to update the file, the CDN will refresh, and then you guys are just getting the latest file from the CDN. So uh, a, a fairly easy way to implement kind of a live refresh, uh, pushing out data while your your user doesn't have to, um, you know, hit any sort of anything like an F5. So I kind of want to show that uh, there is a mix of, you could push out entire HTML pages, or you could have a nice designer build this whole entire page to make it look super nice. And then you just have a few tables that actually needs live data. So then uh, from your flow, you don't need to update the whole HTML. You could just push out a few JSON blobs or push out images, right? Like with the other flow. And then uh, over here, uh, use a little bit of JavaScript to just put that on a timer every five minutes go and pull that data again and see if you need to refresh. Uh, let me quickly show that JavaScript just to, I don't want to scare everyone, but I don't want to say it's super complicated. Uh, using the asynchronous JavaScript call, query the URL slash JSON. So that will, that's basically an absolute path on the same domain. Uh, we say it is JSON file. And then when that returns, this function will run inside with the data, which is the JSON from this file. We're going to first empty this table. So everything in this P body gets empty. So that all gets deleted. And then for each row in the data, which row, we're going to create a new TR with these three table values, which maps my select from the beginning, and then append that to this T body. OK? So that's basically how that whole thing works. Um, I could probably hit the F5, F12 here. So just hit the debugger sources. For people that are familiar with JavaScript, this will seem, you know, very basic. But um, I kind of wanted to just show this be complete. So you see the debugger is paused. The JavaScript is called, is actually came back. And if I hover over this row, you see the row is the current item, and do I can I see that? No, I can see that. Let me put the breakpoint at the, the end. So we are inside one of the rows. So you see that's one of the row, and that's gonna loop four times. And you can see the background is appending. And then when I run out of rows and go outside, you see the data has is an array with all five. Okay, and if I show the network tab, you see the data JSON. The preview is the array. So that's the static file, and that's the array coming back as JSON. OK, so um, some quick API concepts. Um, yeah, OK, let me, let me 
I won't. I will talk about this next bit, but I won't have time to demo it. So the next part really is uh, we can also change the post, right? So the the guest here, when we do an update, we call this flow directly, which means we have to embed this flow, which is not just super yucky. Um, in fact, we we go to this flow. Where is it? Uh, request that one. So in fact, it's this guy. It's URL. So um, with an API gateway, so with something like uh, Azure Functions doing the API, you could pop over to proxy, uh, add a new one, just call it, um, I don't know, API. Be our guest. Uh, it is any method. The backing is this one. And in fact, it's um, let's leave that as a guess. Yeah. So that's going to create a new API thing. That's not refreshing. So I don't know whether it's creating. I hope I create. Oh, no. Here we go. Oh, wow. OK, copy that. So um, let's go pop back here. Uh, in fact, I could get rid of this whole thing. Be our guess. And in fact, because we're already on that URL, we don't need that. And let's keep that as good. And we don't need any of this because that's now all embedded in it. So if I pop back to be our guest, which is here, um, we should be able to do John um, Edge of function, function proxy. Yeah, and it just comes back. That is so, you know, when it works so nice, it's like, here we go, 10 seconds ago. Uh, when it works so well, it's like, oh, nothing happened. Uh, there is the proxy request, OK? So if you want to hide these uh, keys and whatnot, having an Azure function in front of it with a simple proxy uh, is super nice. Um, so definitely recommend this part. Uh, you need something that could split the static information, which is what the CDN is storing, versus the live API that's actually going to hit your flow. So the Azure function proxy lives here to do this work. The other product that you can use is Azure API management, which is a little bit more pricey, but, um, but more enterprise scale, um, can ha handle volume data a lot bigger, but it also has a serverless tier. So it's not too crazy now. Maybe I'm gonna randomly say probably ten bucks a month, so not not crazy. And then um, if you are really, uh, you don't really need traffic manager because we're using the CDN in front. There is an Azure Traffic Manager which I traditionally also recommend. That the Traffic Manager allows you to say, um, Europe, go to this. Azure Functions and US go to that Azure Functions and Australia go to this. So in my case, I will have my flow deployed to three different instances. But for you, you will be routed correctly. But because we're putting a CDN in front, you don't have you don't really need it. So that's fine. Um, let me come back to my slides. I hope I give you lots of ideas. I do need my time to finish. Sorry. So very quickly, uh, data source, push that to storage. You could generate HTML and JSON. Uh, the browser, you're really just, oh, sorry, if you're sending browser data back to data source, we did the post form. Uh, I did not do post JSON, but you use something like jQuery to help you do a post JSON, and you can send it to the endpoint in Azure Functions, and that will go all the way back to flow. And then you can actually have this, the flow, rather than send back a redirect, your flow could actually send back the new JSON, which um, which your web application can use to refresh. Uh, 
the data source pushing to right. So uh, yeah, so if your browser wants to get data from data source, you could get from an API. So we can have a flow where the static application could call the flow and then give you live data, dynamic data, or you could get it from CDN. So the browser, the data source pushes a public copy to the CDN and your browser just fetch from it, which is the demo that I show. Uh, you can push files on. So if you want pictures and whatnot, you can do that. Uh, this is a more advanced topic. So just to show you where these things can grow, um, we can, I mentioned you could use JavaScript. So put that query on a five minute timer. So you just keep checking the CDN to see the data, the JSON updated. Uh, that is what's called a hammer polling. Basically, you're just hammering the server. But in this case, there's no server, so it's safe. So you're just hammering the CDN. Um, Cloudflare might be up. No, Cloudflare is not upset that you. They handle this all day. Um, next is uh, web sockets. So these are more in the uh, the developer web technologies. But we now have web sockets. We have Signal R. We have HTTP two, which means that the browser and the CDN could maintain an open connection, so that if you were to push an update to the CDN, it then tells the browser that there is a new file update. So these are super cool. Uh, coming along, but not that easy to demo right now. So maybe in the future. Um, I also want to talk about embedding, and this is where this formatting screwed up. I'm so sorry. Okay. With some JavaScript, you can embed into Microsoft Teams. Right? It's very easy to create a static site, embed that in iframe. In Power Apps, uh, I'm going to call out to the crazy Power Addict Yash and MVP. Yash has created an iframe PCF. And that gives you a, a super easy way to embed these kind of static websites, super easy. Um, SharePoint's old content editor web part, this is in the classic mode. As well as, you know, if you are in a no JavaScript environment, so even if you just have WordPress and Squarespace and all you have is basic HTML, you cannot add any JavaScript, well, you could still do that form post back uh, directly. Um, uh, you can do the refresh, but then, you know, every time you can update the HTML. Um, uh, I did that in a demo for a Power uh, Apps portal app. You could uh, configure a HTML form snippet in the portal app and have a user submit data directly to a flow. You don't need to redirect them back, but that's totally workable. Uh, you can use SharePoint Embed, which is the in the modern experience, and any kind of system that supports an iframe, you could get your experience into that. Um, so the summary is uh, build more gem sites. They're easy to build, super high performance, very cheap. Practice, and this is important, this improves your technical cloud skills. So you need to play a little bit with Azure Functions. You do need to go and spin up a blob storage. Uh, but these are great practices to improve your cloud skills. And Gemstack is a serious uh, uh, kind of evolving uh, and maturing area in the cloud. So you'll see this everywhere. So I want you to be prepared. Um, Gem Gemstack is a not a new concept. If you think about it, before we have all these dynamic pages, the whole world started with static HTML. So we are really moving back with some of the old pieces that have been around for 50 years, but we're now giving a new spin on it. We are pushing it into CDN, uh, reducing the role of a live server, uh, but getting all these uh, features or, or capabilities that you have. You know, if you have scenarios where you want a portion of your application to be exposed to hundreds and thousands of people. And right now we usually stick with something like Microsoft Form because it's a public thing, right? Like you could have Microsoft Form trigger a flow uh, that's public. Um, but imagine you can now just build any kind of static website and then have that call a flow. And in fact, you can push data back out to it, which you never could do with um, someone's click <laughs> and which you never could do with Microsoft uh, Form. So uh, more scenarios to think about, super easy to build. Uh, our tools have evolved, and uh, I think the Power Platform and Flow here, but also, you know, even embedded experience in Power Apps and Power BI has made these super easy to make. Um, so I wanted to show you that. 
Now, I did wanted to show this picture, which is what I had in my mind, that, you know, we are here. Here's a ninja technique. Uh, it's really, I'm, this is not my technique. I'm just summarizing the technique in a way that the Power Platform could really use. Um, and as that's tomorrow. But really, I like this picture better. The trick is this shortcut, go in here, use flow. <laughs> that is the trick. <laughs> it's not a superpower. It's like if you look at all these tips, you know, they are not complex, any one of them. But um, it's combining them together and realizing, oh, okay, this is a great way to build a gem stack. So um, there's a gem. I don't know who this group is, but there is someone that created a, a, a landing page for GemStack and it's got some good information. I've been creating a GemStack uh, video series where I go into some of these more detailed areas, like how do you really configure the Cloudflare? How do you tweak uh, blob storage? How do you do Azure Functions? Uh, so those little bits. So that's ongoing. Uh, very keen to hear any requests or what you want to see. I'm going to totally run out of time. I'm just going to answer in chat afterwards. Um, read about Azure Functions Proxy in there, and then uh, you can visit my links. And I have one minute. Let me ask you the questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, I told you I spent so many demos. 